Closures are a super common concept in JavaScript. If you've spent some time with the language, you're probably already using them, even if you don't know that you are. It's one of those concepts that makes a good but tricky interview question. So let's take a look at a definition and then take some time for coding practice. Before we can talk about closures, we need to review how JavaScript scope works. Scope refers to the area within a computer program where a variable is available. Variables are created and exist within different regions. They're essentially bound to certain regions within your application. Now, JavaScript uses something called lexical scoping. Lexical scope describes how variable scopes are determined when there is a function inside another function. Using lexical scope, the inner function will have access to variables in the parent function. And this is essentially what a closure is. A closure is created when you use the function keyword inside another function. Now that means that variables can remember the environment that they were created in. That doesn't happen in other types of languages and it allows you to do some special things in JavaScript. So let's take a look. Now here I have a pretty simple example of a function. The only sort of strange thing is that I have another function right inside this parent function. And when I call this function right here, it executes this other inner function because I'm calling this inner function right here as well. And so all it does is display a number, but then after it displays that number, it increments it with this plus plus operator. So if I were to call this increment function again, let's go ahead and clear this and run, you'll notice that now it will count to two. So the second time this function was called, the my number variable had already been incremented to two. And then when we run this console log, it's displaying that value. So I could keep on doing that. And that function is going to keep on remembering the value of my number, which changes as we run the different copies of that function. Now, closures are also common inside object definitions, and they can show you a little bit better how the closures can remember the state. So let's take a look at an example of that. So here's a separate function that does something pretty similar. It just adds numbers up. Now, this is a little bit different because we have this in object notation here. So we've created an object and we've assigned that object a my value variable, which is initialized in one and then this object returns two different methods this display method which just shows you the value of the variable called my value here and then this increment method which adds one to that value so if we create a variable right here called my thing and we assign that object to that variable this my thing will essentially be an instance of this object so if you use the display method, what's going to happen is it's going to display the value of my value right here. Now, if I run the increment method, of course, then it's going to increment that value. And if I display that again, it's going to show the new sort of version of that value. So I could just grab a couple of these and let's go ahead and paste them and clear this out and run. You can see that now it's incremented it to three. So every time I'm calling the function, even though the object has already been created, these methods are actually changing the value of this variable right here. And the interesting thing is also that if I create another instance of that object, let's go ahead and copy this and we'll go ahead and change these to other for this other variable. Let's go ahead and clear this out and run. Notice that when it displays the value of other right here, it's displaying it with the value of this variable being one. Again, because this is a different instance of the object. So this my value is only available inside each of these different objects or the instances, and they are uniquely incremented by these different methods. Now, it's only one here because we didn't really display the increment, but you sort of get how this works. One thing that you have to be careful when using closures is what happens inside loops. Since closures remember the value of the environment that they were created in, 
Inside loops, those variables are constantly changing. That's what loops do. And by the time the closures are called, the loop has already modified the values within that loop. So let's take a look at how we can work around it. And before I do that, this technique is actually called a function factory. It's a technique where you create a loop to create a series of functions. It works really well for creating a series of events. So let's dig into a more practical example. I've got a form right here and I want to create some different alerts uh, with data that I want people to enter into these text area fields. So this is a pretty simple sort of form and I've installed Bootstrap here just to make things a little bit nicer. Uh, and you can see that we've got just a form and a couple of form elements, nothing too special right here. So we'll go into the script and you'll see that I've created a couple of sort of attributes in this item text object. And it's essentially gonna hold the ID of the element that we want to modify as well as the text that we want to display in each of these objects. So I could sort of create some different text for a very large form that somebody has to fill out, perhaps a medical form. And what I'm doing here in this function is taking care of displaying the elements. So this is just a series of calls that select one of these items and then inserts a node that shows these text elements. So this is not really that interesting to worry about. All the interesting stuff is going to happen right here. So what I want to do is create a series of events that are going to track me clicking on these different elements. So we'll do that inside this setup item. I created a variable called DOM element that I want to target the elements that I want to get. So what I'm going to do here is create a variable that is going to be the length of the elements that we have. So essentially this item text remember is this sort of object with these elements. And so I wanna loop through those items. And in here, I want to go ahead and select the different elements. So I'm gonna do a DOM element here, and that's gonna be equal to the element I want to choose. So document query selector. And I'm going to look for the item text ID, right? So this DOM element is going to have a node that is pointing to each one of these different item IDs, which correspond to elements in the form. Once I do that, I can add a set of event listeners. So I'll do DOM element, add event listener, and I'm going to look for a focus event listener. So when somebody clicks on either one of the different text areas, then I'm going to create or actually execute a function that I'm going to create. So called init item, and I'm going to pass along the ID of the element as well as the text. So that's an item text. And since we're in a loop, it would be i.id and item text i dot text. So let's go ahead and make this a lot wider so we could see this a little bit better. So what we've done here is created a series of listeners that are going to listen for clicks inside those different elements. Now I've created this item here called init item because this is a loop and if I don't do this and I try to create a function say like a callback here then because this loop is executing constantly, the closure would receive the last value of those elements. So I have to create sort of an in-between function here. And I'm gonna do that here, function init item, and I'm going to just pass along the ID and the text here. And all this in-between function is going to do is to return. And this is actually the closure. We're gonna return a function that is going to call the handle item and pass along the ID and the text as well. So let's go ahead and save this and we'll make our window a little bit smaller. 
And now you can see that when I click on these different elements, the different pieces of text will be injected into our form. So the interesting thing here is that this closure is allowing the state of our loop here to be remembered. So it remembers when it creates these different events, what the state of the text that's supposed to go inside each of these items is. Now the error would be to try to put a function right here. If we did that, then it would not be able to remember the values of the text as well as the ID. It would just loop to the last element and then show us only the last element always. So that's the trick that you have to remember when you're using a closure inside a loop. You have to create sort of a sub-closure that allows you to get the elements properly. <laughs>